Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days, when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So, we all belong to different groups. And each group has values or ideals that they honor. So we belong to family or church, schools, circles of friends, nations, and such. And we have different ideals that each of these groups have. And every group, every one of these groups has a system of honor or shame that encourages behavior consistent with its values. So when you're a part of a group, you can expect to encounter these, these values, and you can expect to be encouraged when you are acting consistent with these values, and when you go against them, you can expect to be discouraged. So sometimes the encouragement will come as a pat on the back, or maybe it will be even a medal of honor, but behavior consistent with the group values is what is encouraged. Now, when you undermine the group values, then you are shamed. Now, shame doesn't mean feeling bad about yourself. It means that you are going to be discouraged from doing the behavior that you are doing. We, in an individualistic culture like, like ours, we tend to think of shame as just feeling bad about yourself. But in a group culture, which was the Bible and most Eastern cultures of today, Shame means that you, that you are conforming to the group or trying, you're being encouraged to conform to that group. So the pressure to conform. And that could be something as small as just a sour glance from somebody or it could be getting put in jail because you need to be corrected and fixed from the behavior that, that you're in. But honor and shame happens even in, in our culture too. So somebody who's in, been in the news a lot is a quarterback by the name of Colin Kaepernick. And uh, he, as many of you know, 
doesn't stand for the national anthem, and this has caused a, a great controversy. So there's honor and shame in all of this. So he doesn't want to honor the flag or this, this country for the national anthem because of what he says is bad treatment of certain groups. And so he chooses to shame the nation for how it treats these groups. And in turn, because he is shaming the nation, many people who are very patriotic are in turn shaming him, trying to get him to fall back in line to honor the nation. This is all honor and shame power plays here. There's not a lot of debate about what, what needs to happen or what is, what is good. It's mostly it's just honor and shame power plays here. So this is about pressure to conform. This is what honor and shame is about. It's about trying to get everybody in line with the group. So what's going on in our passage today is different kinds of honor and shame that are in conflict with one another. So in verse 32, it says, Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Becoming a Christian, at least for the people of Hebrews here, becoming a Christian meant enduring shame. They were going to be pressured and, and forced even to try to go back to not being Christians anymore. The world's values and Christ's values are at odds with one another. There are different sets of ideals there. And when you go against one, you are pressured to conform back. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both. And so if you're following Christ, you're going to be going against the values and ideas of the world, and the world is going to shame you to try to get you back in line with their ideals. So this is what's going on with the people of Hebrews. Now, I want to point out here that worshiping pagan gods was much a part of everyday life in the Roman Empire, no matter where you were. Worshiping pagan gods would be integrated into almost every activity that you would have. So all of the festivals that they would have, all of the family celebrations, if you, were, uh, and if you practiced one of the trades and you were in a guild, then part of your guild would be worshiping some sort of patron deity. If you were into sports, there would be something in the games that would be honoring towards some pagan god. If you went to the theater, there would be some sort of patron deity of the theater that you'd have to revere. So incorporation of some act of reverence towards the god was in almost everything, including private dinner parties, because even households had their own patron gods even. And government as well. If you wanted to serve Serve the public. There, here's one ancient Roman writer who said this, it would be easier to build a city without the ground it stands on than to establish or sustain a government without religion. In other words, adherence to the gods. So if you were going to become a Christian in this environment, you'd have to basically withdraw completely from society. You'd have to completely go against everything else. For the Roman world, the gods were guardians of stability. If you didn't acknowledge them, giving them their due, then that was not just, not just well, you can do your own thing. That was like a threat to public stability. Pagan authors at the time wrote about how Christian absence in these worship of deities incited anger among the gods and endangered the city and the empire. So when these Christians are withdrawing from worshiping the gods, that's not just them going to their own destruction. They're threatening the whole empire. This is, this is scary stuff. We've got to get these Christians back in line. It says, one Roman writer put it this way, Christians were condemned for their hatred 
of humanity. That's how Christians were viewed. They hated humanity. So withdrawing from common activities makes the pagan world think that Christianity is some sort of subversive cult. I mean, when you talk about cults today, you know, there's a charismatic leader and and everybody, you know, there's a group of people that will follow this guy and kind of do whatever he says. You know, they tend to withdraw from their families. They kind of neglect their work. They don't do things that they normally did before. They, you know, turn over all things that they own to this cult leader or whatever. And we see these sorts of things and we think, well, that's a cult. Well, people were seeing people, people of the Roman Empire were seeing these Christians starting to withdraw from public life. And they were thinking, well, this is a cult. It's like they're saying they're too good for us or they're, they're better or that we're wrong for worshiping these gods. 1 Peter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says this, The time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. And with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. You're not doing all those things anymore and so they're heaping ridicule on you because of that. So these people of Hebrews here, they were being shamed trying to conform to the way that they used to be, to the group ideals. And in verse 33, it says they were officially and publicly shamed. They were not casually shamed. They were officially shamed in some sort of official capacity here. It says sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated. So they are being targeted officially for this kind of shame that drives them back into being good pagan Roman people, like they're supposed to be. When it says publicly exposed, that is actually a word that is associated with being on stage in the theater. So if you can imagine being publicly shamed on a stage like that, that's just kind of what they are enduring. This is the kind of public shame that they have. And those who weren't shamed stood next to those who were. So, for example here, this is what you call a pillory. This is a kind of an ancient, well, that's ancient, but it's, it's, it's an old form of, of, uh, of, of justice where somebody who did something wrong would be locked in that, thing, you know, you have two pieces of wood with spots for the hands and the head and, and you, they'd just lock you in there and you'd be stuck there. And so everybody who walked by would know that, oh, look what you did. You know, what an awful person you are. And they could insult you or whatever. And it doesn't harm you exactly. It's not comfortable to be in that thing. But it was placed on a stage in a public place and the point was to humiliate and shame the victim for their crimes. And the crowd would throw objects at the victim, like rotten vegetables, dead animals, or even feces, and sometimes even stones or other objects, even such like that too. So this, I mean, something like this is probably what they were enduring. So imagine, imagine you're a Christian and you're in one of those things, and people are throwing all kinds of junk at you. They're saying the worst things that they can say to you. You're on public display because you're a Christian. They think that you're somebody who hates humanity. You're withdrawing your worship from the gods. And because of that, the whole empire is under threat. We're all going to go down now because of you. How dare you? You're an awful person. And physical violence even is also implied. When, in, when I was translating this passage, it wasn't just verbal abuse that they were enduring. I mean, it sounds like there was at least some amount 
of physical violence that they were enduring. Some sorts of, some sorts of beatings or, or punchings or assaults of some kind. It wasn't just words. This is something that we don't really have to endure as Christians here and now. And that's very, that's very nice. But for most people, especially at this time when Christianity was just, just darkening the door of history, this was, this was common. Verse 34 says, Their houses were plundered. In uh, Alexandria at one time, there were a bunch of Jews of that city, and they were driven from their homes out of four of the city's five wards, and they were herded together in one ward, kind of like in a ghetto of sorts. And uh, it says, Their enemies overran the houses now left empty and began to loot them, dividing up the contents like spoils of war. Imagine being driven from your home and having this crowd of people just rush into your house and walk away with all kinds of stuff that you had, all your valuables, gone. And you had to find some new place to live. You maybe have the clothes on your back, maybe one or two things that you could carry, and that's it. These were all shame tactics to pressure Christians to conform. They wanted these new Christians to come back to their old ways of living, to worship the pagan gods again, to bring back stability to society. They weren't executed yet. In chapter 12, verse 4, it says, you haven't yet been pressed to the point of shedding your blood. So nobody was killed yet. So they're not trying to get rid of the Christians. They're trying to pressure them into returning to their old ways. Now, when you violate the world's ideals, the world will shame you until you're back in line. They would love it if these Christians would be like, oh yeah, this is a dangerous cult and we're going to go back. That's, that would be the idea. What does the sixth request of the Lord's Prayer mean? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one means... By ourselves, we are too weak to hold our own, even for a moment. And our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, never stop attacking us. And so, Lord, uphold us and make us strong with the strength of your Holy Spirit, so that we may not go down to defeat in this spiritual struggle but may firmly resist our enemies until we finally win the complete victory. So the devil and the world and our flesh continue to attack us to try to get us to live like they were, like we did before Christ. And we need the strength of Christ to help us with that. So in all of this shame that the people of Hebrews were experiencing, the recipients of Hebrews accepted the world's shame with joy, it says. They, they accepted this with joy. Almost like this was a good thing. It says in verse 34, You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. You accepted that joyfully. Can you imagine people plundering your house and you accepting that joyfully? It's kind of a stretch, isn't it? That's what it says about these people. But they could do this. They could accept this joyfully because they knew that in spite of this shame, there was a greater honor that was coming. In verse 34, it says, You yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. It's coming. Your confidence, which has a great reward, it's coming. You may receive what is promised. It's on its way. So all of this is showing that there's something coming. There's a greater honor that's in store. And because there's a greater honor coming, we can accept the shame now with joy, even. Because what the world shames, God honors. The world and God are, 
have different ideas about what is really good and what is worth pursuing. And so when we are going against the world but honoring God, God honors that. In verse 39, it says their hard struggle, which was referenced in verse 32, is what proves their faith authentic. So, in this whole passage that we read, I'm mostly focusing on the last part, but if you notice, there's kind of a a progression here. In 19 through 25, he basically says, let's follow through on what we have in Christ. We have a great salvation here. Then in 26 through 31, he talks about warning them of falling away. Don't, Don't fall away. But then in 32 through 38, he says, you didn't fall away. And then at the conclusion there, we are not the kind that shrinks back. So what he's saying here is essentially that all of this persecution, this shame that you're enduring from everybody else, this has proved that you are not the kind that shrinks back. Because we're not supposed to shrink back, as as you know. You endured all of this with joy, even. So we are not the kind that shrinks back and are destroyed. We are the kind that perseveres and are saved. He's using this persecution to encourage them, to boost them up, to saying, your faith is authentic. This is not just casual faith. This is not temporary faith. This is not human faith. This is divine faith. And you are going to persevere. Jesus was shamed and killed on the cross. But in resurrection, God exalted him. The cross is a symbol of suffering and shame. Jesus was against all of the ideals that the world has. But because Jesus endured that shame, he received the greatest glory that God can bestow. Hebrews 12, 2-3. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Look at what Jesus did. This is who we're supposed to follow. He endured the worst shame that the world could throw at him, the worst death under the greatest suffering. And look what God did to him. He is sitting now at the right hand of God in eternal glory. This little bit of temporary shame reaped for him in eternal glory. We're following that same path. Our little bit of temporary shame is going to reap in eternal glory too. Jesus was shamed because he stood against everything that the world values. The world opposes Jesus because the way, his way rather, is a threat to everything that the world values. So, I have a little list up here. To contrast, the world would say, stay safe. That's a value. But Jesus, his way was dying the worst death. Living long is a value of the world. Well, Jesus died young. He was only 33 when he died. Family first is a worldly value. Jesus, when his family came after him because they thought he was crazy, they wanted to basically arrest him and take him away, he disowned his family. Education. Jesus did not study. He did not have the rabbinical training. Eat well. Jesus fasted for 40 days. That was not not a smart thing to do by uh, health standards. Be nice. Jesus made everybody angry. Do or get a good job. He was a carpenter when he could have been a king, and he gave up his carpentry work for ministry where there's no income at all. He had to depend on the generosity of others. Get married and have kids. He had no wife or no children. Climb the ladder of success. Well, he was a servant. He washed his own disciples' feet like a slave. Be popular. He hung out with prostitutes, tax collectors, and lepers, the people that nobody wanted to be around. Jesus is against the world's ideals and its values. Everything that he was and did 
was against what the world stands for. And the world doesn't put up with that. They can't take it. And so they had to shame him. They had to get rid of him, but not just kill him. They didn't just send a, an assassin in the night to just get rid of him and make him disappear. No, they had to publicly shame him so that everybody else would take warning. This is what happens to people who go against our ideas. If the world shames you for walking like Jesus, God says you are blessed. And there's a bunch of scriptures that support this. 1 Peter 4.16, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Don't be ashamed. Glorify God. Or Jesus said this, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. That's me. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. If the world shames you for being like Jesus, that is an honor. So, when the world shames you, Jesus says, this is an honor. Instead of being shamed, be honored. So, just for some examples here. So, if your country throws you in prison or into court because your primary citizenship is the kingdom of heaven, that's an honor. If your whole group of friends laughs and mocks you for being a friend, first of all, to Jesus... Because maybe you obey your parents, maybe you don't go out partying, or maybe you're still a virgin. That's an honor. If you lose your job because your ultimate boss is Christ in heaven, that's an honor. If you surrender your temporary possessions because you know that you have eternal possessions, that's not foolish, that's an honor. If you put yourself in physical danger to bring the good news of Jesus to a hostile place, that's not foolish. That's an honor. God's values and the world's values are at odds with one another. And what the world shames to get you back in line with their values, God honors because you're in line with His. And the honor from God is worth any shame from the world. Whatever the world can throw at you for shame to try to get you back in line, God's honor is eternal. It's worth whatever shame you would have to endure. So I want to encourage you today to walk the way of Jesus, which is at odds with the ways of the world and our own sinful nature for that matter, and endure the shame of the world. Put up with it even with joy, seeking honor from God, not men, looking forward to what is to come. Let's bow our heads. Lord our God, we live in a world that is, that is hostile to you and to what is important to you. And Lord, you call us to live in this world and to even endure the shame that comes from following you in this world. Lord, help us to endure this shame, even with joy, to keep set before us who you are, the glory that is in Jesus Christ, and all the suffering and shame that he endured. Help us to walk these paths, Lord, no matter what shame is thrown at us, so that you are praised, honored, and glorified, and that we, Lord, would know what true honor is. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.